Well, I'm hit. We hit record, <laughs> and we missed that one. Using what the plan for tonight is to commit a crime against podcasting. Ouch. I, That's I, you know, what we do every week, every time we dawdle around to this. Yeah, we we even commit a crime with our own absence, right? Because it's like, oh, they're a thing, and then nothing. We're a nothing. Crimes of omission and commission. Oh, oh, fucking Jesus! Um, Take yeah. two. No, <laughs> we're back. No, I mean, uh, it's been so long since we did this. The long views. Yeah, this is. Oh yeah, this is take two because we this fucked is take it up two, last night. Because I fucked it up last time. No, it's it's. So now it's we have innocent, to go again. You just you know, it's the, the it's the beginning of training camp, and you just haven't caught a pass in a while. Yeah, and I didn't take my vaccine. What are you going to do? Bench me? I got a Maybe. contract. No, I, I, <laughs> I, I took the vaccine. Audience. Oh, okay. this that's a Kirk Cousins joke. Minnesota Vikings quarterback is anti-vax, and uh, <laughs> it's a problem. It's a problem for the Vikings? Is that what this is? Yeah. Is this, like, all they've been talking about? Well, they're not going to talk about their preseason record. What is this, a sports podcast? <laughs> it can be. <laughs> the Timberwolves like got to a... trade for Ben Simmons right away. <laughs> but don't give up Jaden McDaniels, because he's going to be... All right, shut up. <laughs> Christ. All right. All right. Uh, who are you? I'm uh, Harlan. The kids don't get it, Grant. And I'm Ryan Dude Knights McKenna. And this is the Doddler's Philosophy Podcast. Review. Review. What are we reviewing? We have uh, to do a review, I think, or it might benefit part of our vast audience if we were to do a review. Because, like, in a sensible way, I think, as the reasonable people we are, some of our earliest podcast episodes were the topics into which we have invested the most effort and care about the most. Because we're passionate about these things, and we've got these projects, and we're like, hey, we got a podcast now. Let's get our ideas out there. <laughs> but that's also way back when, instead of having 200 listeners, we had two listeners. So maybe many of the current uh, tribe we've accumulated here might not have even heard some of our main uh, our favorites. Our That's right. Hits and misses. Yeah, and it, 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 as a quick side note, I I I thought about this just because I was looking at, you know, some of the more popular versus the least popular episodes, and some of our least popular episodes are these favorites, and in, in part that might be because that they happen so early on, and some people may not bother to listen to the whole catalog as I do. I go and I'm like, well, I like that topic, so I'll listen to that episode. So who's gonna care about uh something called enemy skepticism or a or strange... god forbid episodic synchrony or try them and joy they're gonna skip right over those not knowing how serious a mistake it was and these are things that we reference frequently in our contemporary episodes so maybe why not let's take a moment go back and do a quick hitter and put at least those three back on tape. Damn right. Damn right. All right, so should we start with the uh, Triamond situation? Makes sense to me. All right, so this is uh, this thing that we've come up with about, we call it the modes of inquiry. And it's mostly just a way to try and, for ourselves, organize, you know, I think, to an extent, it's somewhat the motivations behind why somebody is 
taking on a particular kind of approach to thinking about things or doing science or whatever, you know, a discourse, all that. So uh, often there are these kind of ways that I think can be grouped together in these different categories uh, that people behave when they're doing inquiry or investigations or discussions about intellectual things. And uh, so the there's there you could <laughs> the reason why it's a triamond is because it on one hand is a triangle if you look at it with with a certain pair of eyes namely Harlan's and it's a diamond if you look at it from my point of view but then really it's just like two axes coming together but whatever so uh, the four things are truth seeking game playing overseeing and engineering is the fourth, uh, let's just say, adjunct one at the moment, uh, mode of inquiry. Yeah. And I, <laughs> you were the first one to come up with the initial triangle, and I really liked it. And then ever since, we've kind of been balancing this back and forth and making various additions or complications. Right. Uh, and it's been growing ever since. And this yeah. is something that we talk about in almost I know in the last episode I recorded in my last letter to you I talked about it. So right. I think we both find it very useful and some other of our little cabal that we've introduced it to have found it useful. Among other things I think it's a nice way to it's kind of a crutch or whatever an abstraction and it can be inaccurate but it's a way to help interpret some of the texts of others, be they verbal or written. Yeah. When this person says this, are they saying that from the position of someone who dogmatically thinks that they have discovered the truth, or are they more like just playing a game or, you know, eh. uh, yeah. A right. To, so yeah. the one thing it seems to me, and this is why I like, the idea of going over this again is because on this i this set of ideas this framework uh for thinking this as uh, you know dennett would like to talk about tool for thinking or whatever um it's kind of like you know on the one hand you and i harlan say this stuff all the time and when we say it i just go oh yeah you know that's an oh yeah for sure that's overseeing right oh, oh he's a truth seeker you know that kind of thing but then at the same time, like I've mentioned before, and you had mentioned already just, you know, a few f sentences back that it's kind of, it's growing. It's kind of like a living document in a, in a way. So it, we keep adding things to it. And if you went back to the original Triumph and Joy episode, you'll see like we take it in all these different directions. And so it's, it's productive for us for screwing around and having fun with the idea, but also it's productive for us in a kind of like, you know, on the spot way of talking about you know uh of different approaches to just thinking about say solving a problem or or trying to make more problems anyway on and on yeah so to do i, I think i'll we'll start doing a little review of of what okay. this idea is right Are we ready yeah yeah we're ready so version 1.0 is <laughs> just the triangle which in the way that we typically visualize it at the top of the pyramid is this thing that we call truth seeking this mode of inquiry called truth seeking and when i describe that i just say they have two basic premises or assumptions their foundation is based around these two things one there are fixed points and two there is some methodology by which we can either access or approach possessing those points. The, it's just the basic gold thing about, well, there's a reality out there, and I can look at it, and I know it. I, there's a tree in the yard means I have this sentence that corresponds to the reality. There's a tree out there, I looked at it, so now I know, and that's the truth. Yep. 
That one's pretty good. That one's the, probably the most solid one, at least in terms of it has these two like tenets or whatever, you know. Right. And I think for, in my interpretation, one of the reasons why that one's intuitive and easy to understand is that that is the default epistemic position of humanity on Earth so far. That we grow up in it, and that's how our language is structured, and that's how most of our role models perceive things. That's just how we tend to do it. It's pervasive. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the good, yeah. What, <laughs> words! I like words. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So what's the difference? Then there's these game players down on the, le- on the left corner. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And if I, when I try to make an, I, I don't want to say analogous, but I will. A, a, an isomorphic, whatever, yeah, two-premise yeah. thing for them. Sure. It's like there are rule sets is number one. And number mm-hmm. two would be by operating within a given rule set, I can produce something of value. What those values can be can be very different. And what the sets of rules can be can be very different. You know, it's big. Right. But I think that steps away from, that doesn't commit you to any sort of truth, correspondence, reality, anything. It's just, well, I, I don't know if it's real that the electron went through both slits. I'm just saying I can make a mathematical model that reflects the outcome of my experiments and the my colleagues will agree with me about certain things and that kind of talk. Right. It's a game that, you know, you play, which is interesting because there are, say, mathematical rules that you must follow in coming up with a mathematical model for, you know, whatever it is, if it's quantum mechanics or something like you were just talking about. And then there's the actual, like, physical contraption, the devices we create, and there's some rules about that, you know, and and so you're constantly screwing around with the rules to try and see if you can come up with a better, even a better numerical model or a better... Um, you know, device or whatever. Like, you know, that's one of the things that Thomas Kuhn always talks about is people are, you know, we're always trying to make a better, like, you know, uh, mass spectrometer, you know, like things like that. But there, we're still playing within all the basic rules that haven't really changed. We're just kind of improving on it, trying to, as he would say, you know, solve it so well, like unlike anyone else kind of thing. There's a little bit of that, a little bit of competition. That's all I'm trying to say. In a game? competition <laughs> as might be right. expected but right. i don't know if that's inherent in the mode of inquiry of game playing but it could be no. a, a prevalent tendency it could be a prevalent tendency yeah yeah exactly you could also be in competition with yourself or whatever you know anyway continue i i agree with i like those two tenets there then in the yeah. lower right is the leftovers the shamans exiled to their tent outside the village because nobody likes what they have to say. No. The overseers. Yeah. Got so when masses. I try to, you know, to keep with the structure, if I try to come up with two things, that this is the hardest one to do that for. But what do you think of this version that I somewhat just thought of on my feet? On Damn my, it. I'm sitting on my butt Good right at that. now. Yeah. There are parentheses, various unparentheses, gradients is number one. And then number two is we can both identify the locations on and modify. We can identify and modify locations on gradients by altering rule sets or whatever you know yeah you always want to alter the rule sets or go from one rule set to the next because yeah in a sense you want to say there are no rules there's no ultimate rules no fundamental foundational ones nevertheless there are all these different 
values. I think I look at overseeing a lot playing, or I mean interacting with game players, because the way that overseeing interacts with truth seekers in the way I do it is just to say you guys are idiots and you should stop that. Yeah. I mean, because, it's sort of like, yeah. Yeah. The re- I mean, there's a lot more worship in the truth seeking realm and there's a lot more, you know, you could almost, you know, re- religions are kind of sort of the ultimate truth seeking game or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and I think a lot of oversight happens on that as to, you know, I think about even just that the, the new atheist movement there for a while or whatever just seemed a lot of, you know, cri- quite critical of obviously religion and religion has a big component there. But anyway, maybe I'm just shooting the shit here. Yeah, but one of the reasons why religion is no longer a big deal is that they succeeded. The overseeing group? <laughs> I'm, do- I'm somewhat being facetious. <laughs> but also, I mean, it does appear that the industry that we label religion is on the decline, at least in most of the Western world. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, that might, I mean, that one could be refined. Those spelling out those little two premises for two assumptions or behavioral for the overseers. But in general... They're just kind of, they're the people that are meta all the time. They're the ones that do philosophy of X, Y, and Z. Well, there's the biologists, but then there's the philosophers of biology, you know. And then certain game players take the attitude that the philosophers of science are as useful as pigeons on statues or whatever the thing is. (laughs) No, the, the, yeah, birds and ornithology thing, right? Was the Richard Feynman. Anyway. Yeah. All right. So do I, are you, uh, I, you know, to be honest, I, 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 let's move now to engineering. If you don't have anything else to say about overseeing, I think my view on overseeing is, uh, Definitely, uh, I think in in, in accordance with, with what you're saying, I do think that is, it is, sometimes I think about game playing tends to take a more sort of descriptive uh, approach and that I think that overseeing it tends to take a more kind of prescriptive approach, more of a, you know, it's more feedback, you know, whereas in the game, I guess, maybe... Uh, in game playing, it, maybe feedback within the game might have a little buzzer that goes, Meh, you know, and you're like, oh, can't do that or whatever. If you write a script and you then it, maybe your software it makes a little Doom. sound every time it's, it can't run because there's a problem in the writing of the script or something. But I feel like overseeing is a little bit further beyond just simply up, you cross the line on the game rule thing. It's more of a, you know, why are you playing with these rules? <laughs> you know, or it seems to me anyway. And, you know, wouldn't it be better or if it, there seems to be a more suggestive quality to overseeing? Uh, and it, I wouldn't say it's a position of authority. It's definitely still a mode of inquiry. I just think that it's, uh, it takes a different perspective, I guess. When you're playing, when you're game playing, you're in the game or whatever, the container of the game, you know, that kind of thing. You were talking about containers in the last letter. Um, you're kind of in it. And so you sort of, that's the, the limits, you know, remember the Wittgenstein thing, the limits of my language is the limits of my world, you know, or the limits of the rule sets is the limits of my concerns in the game, you know, that I'm playing. And, and overseeing appears to me to take a step uh it's more of an audience to game playing and truth seeking in a way. Or, I mean, it could be the role of the referee, right? The referee, as well as the crowd, who is also like a a privileged audience member, if you will, you know, they, Mm -hmm. because, you know, people in the audience would love to yell, be like, that wasn't a foul or whatever. They'd love to be down there on the field saying what goes and what's okay. Or, you know, um, so yeah. So then, Engineering is tough because we've done, you've done these two little points. Um, 
again, I don't. I, let me really quickly say: Does have you said all that you wanted to about overseeing? Um, right, good enough for now. The only other yeah. thing that I would add about just this overall project is to emphasize that it's not necessarily like one human is one of these three and only and right. always is that or whatever, but that any it's more about any given text or speech act or something that it qualifies mostly as, well, you know, I was just get, playing a game right now or, oh, I was acting like an overseer or whatever. And then there's also all of the space in the middle of the triangle where you can be, uh, I'm mostly a game player, but sometimes I lean toward overseeing or, well, right. I'm... I tend, I sometimes get a little truth seeky, but I'm mostly overseer, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, as overseers like to do is you just mentioned, they love their gradients. Um, so yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good to keep in mind throughout this whole thing. So then with engineering, if there's a two parter, I'm, I gotta be flippant, uh, I got to be kind of flippant about this. Um, if, and it's because I haven't really thought about it too deeply, but if there's, you know, with the two, two tenets or whatever, truth seeking has fixed points. Then I guess you could almost say I would play off of it as a game player or whatever, that it has engineering uses fixed points as well, but instead of approaching them or a fixed, you know, like, the truth or whatever it connects points you know and i was thinking about the whole bridge thing that i like to talk about Mm -hmm. where you know it's about putting things together sorry i'm being like i'm bombarded by my dog and my son anyway jesus um just edit them out i mean i mean no the interruption (laughs) not not that i know (laughs) i will (laughs) so uh yeah so i just um (laughs) So that's all I was thinking of. It was, it's it's kind of a, um, it's very pragmatic. I would think it's you know does it work? You know does does the thing work? And you have, um, it's not quite game playing because it's not as experimental. It basically takes, you know, things that are you know pretty well established and uses them to just you know almost like easy fixes or whatever. Just yeah, just you know, bang out. We need a bridge. We make a bridge. We we you know, it's just a very pragmatic, practical way of viewing inquiry. Like, a, when I used to help a friend with, uh, you know, he's a general contractor, and we always had these basic things that we would think about in terms of what the thing is that we were going to do that day. You know, tear down walls, or you're gonna you know, uh, drill into the wall or, you know, you got to, you know, pull out the toilet and do all these kind of things. But every house is different and everything's always a little different. So you kind of, there is a, uh, there is investigation. There is inquiry into the situation because you don't know. It's, it's got all these weird quirks of its own idiosyncrasy, idiosyncrasy, you know, and, and, um, it's just one of those things that you still then just take tried quote unquote tried and true tool sets or or rule not rules but tools or whatever it is and uh you know you just put them in place and and to the best of your understanding based on whatever the little situation is that you've you know been you know investigating or trying to figure out you know that kind of thing Uh, but it's not like you're going into the great unknown in the same way so that's uh that's what that was Jesus. (sighs) Uh, Jesus. <sighs> so right, so that's the uh, the beta of version two that Ryan proposes. Turn the triangle into a diamond and add engineering down on the bottom. And I've <laughs> yeah. so far hesitated to do so because to me, I feel like it would be simpler and cleaner and close enough and accurate enough to just collapse engineering into mostly game playing, maybe a little bit of overseeing. Um, because, you know, if you're going to let that in, then how many other things now are we going to have to have a dodecahedron of modes and whatever, but we don't need to adjudicate all that crap right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's the triamond or the, the modes of inquiry 
in their sort mm-hmm. of developmental state as they almost always are, you know? And another reason that we kind of like this, I think, is that each of us has a self-conception that fits as one of those two on the on the basal hypotenuse there of uh-huh. Ryan the game player and Harlan the overseer. At least we mostly tend to view ourselves and each other, I think, that way. Yes, I think so. As um, evidenced by perhaps the next thing we ought to review. Because <laughs> yeah. you got yeah, a I... game that you play sometimes. <laughs> What's your game? I, I Well, I have a solution to a game because I've played it enough and I think I know. Yeah, is the, uh, would you call the game like evolutionary biology or something like that or you know what would you call the game and then your move in the game is yeah the you know the game maybe this in this particular case the game is you know diversification and diversity and speciation and that of course is all within the evolutionary biology realm and stuff um but then you know (laughs) i don't think i mean there are some hard and fast rules sort of you know right but uh and so I've used some of them to come up with this idea, I guess, to an extent. But I, I won't get into the deep end with it because this is a review. Um, but it does, this idea kind of guide my thinking um, about a lot of the things that happen just in general with anything that has populations, you know, of, you know, in particular. It can even apply to, you know, human behavior, I think. Um, especially when it comes to really just behavior and culture and stuff like that. But um, so, yeah, the idea is, um, you know, kind of based in sort of resource driven evolution at low taxonomic levels. And so, uh, you know, taxonomy is sort of the the study of the tree of life, if you will, or the the relationship between things in biology, uh, especially groups of things. And so low taxonomic levels then are going to be like, you know, it could be, you know, a a pride of lions or, you know, populations, you know, in general or metapopulations, which is populations of populations or some people talk about subspecies and then definitely species. These are all like low taxonomic levels. You get higher up and it's like genus and family and class and order and all that kind of stuff. Those just keep going up. Um and so uh so i guess the this this main character of you know uh you know my thinking about diversification is a mechanism i call episodic synchrony um you can consider like the phases of a chain reaction like there's an initiation phase a propagation phase and a termination phase um so thinking about this like sort of chain reaction type of thing framework Episodic synchrony, then, is an initiation mechanism. So it's something that gets things going. Um, and, uh, you know, so my my particular interest, I guess, is in that realm. Other biologists, say, might be more interested in termination mechanisms. You know, um, there's this one idea about, you know, because there's this huge area of biology which has a bunch of different variations on it but one is called you know um you know there's the species ontology problem and then there's the species delineation problem and all that and all it's trying to say is like you know what is a species and given you have a concept how do you differentiate between things to say that this is a species and this is another species or whatever so uh in the termination mechanism thing, like there's this one concept called the biological species concept and its mechanism is more or less a sort of uh, reproductive isolation. And there's kind of different ways to look at it. Uh, it could be something that happens before two animals or plants or sexually reproducing organisms mate something that stops them from being able to do it like molecular or some kind of physiological thing, or it could be behavioral and they just don't, interact uh you know it could be genetic just over time mutations arise and stuff so that's not what this mechanism is like it's not trying to say and this is how things get sliced and diced it's more like this is how things kind of get going and kind of branch 
uh, or come together and form something new, maybe. Um, so anyway, so I guess I'll say then the short version, which I think I'll only have here, maybe, we'll see, is that sometimes significant changes and vital resources drive consumer populations to change in size. And it's a, it's a, so this is a change in carrying capacity. This happens in spite of or because of like regulating factors, which are, you know, anything from like density, like you get to be too many and you need space and stuff like that. Or uh, it could also be uh, predators or it could be parasites. It could be lots of different things that regulate, um, you know, a population. In general, my view is that consumers, you know, they don't care. They just want their resources. This is the model part here. Um, so large population size changes may come with changes and variation. Some of the usual suspects that contribute to variation are genetics or hybridization or developmental plasticity. In turn, though, variation is the pathway to diversity. So the tipping point is when the population approaches or overshoots its altered carrying capacity, which could go up or down. It doesn't have to be just an increase in carrying capacity. It could be a sudden drop. So in that way, diversification is sort of like a way to relieve the population pressure. And it results in something different in the environment becoming kind of the focus of different variant phenotypes and things like that, different traits that organisms might have. Um, in general, though, the basic, like, one of the things that I, I want to pull up, if you may recall, Harlan, that I don't know if anyone else listening has learned about this, but there was a, um, uh, uh, Joseph Campbell and his, uh, the hero with a thousand faces. And he has this idea, you know, called the hero's journey. And in particular, he has this nuclear unit he calls, you know, which is the nucleus of, of what the hero's journey is, the, the monomyth or whatever. And the idea there is that it just kind of, you've got this three point, uh, stage kind of thing that happens as the hero goes through their journey where they, they, you know, leave, you know, their sort of ordinary world, they enter into an extraordinary world, they change, and then they kind of come back to the ordinary world. And there they, maybe solve a problem for the ordinary world because they're now a hero and they're extraordinary. They've gone through all these trials and tribulations or whatever. And so for episodic synchrony, the I, that nuclear unit or whatever would be that there's a change in resources, which leads to a change in population size, which leads to a change in the variation within that population, which then can lead to uh, diversification, uh, the grouping of uh, you know, uh, within that population of different uh, clusters, if you will. And that's not the only way, but that's just the idea is that diversification comes around, um, you know, in that kind of general pathway, if you will. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much, I don't know if I did a terrible job or a great job, but I'm hoping that it's fairly clear. <laughs> Well, okay, let, should I throw out what I think might be a an example of this? And then through that illustration, you can point out where my conception is flawed or be like, yeah, that that's it. The audience should be able to understand that. Sure. So I guess we'll go under the sea and there'll be uh -huh. some population of fish and they eat smaller fish. They, as their primary source of food, that would be the vital resource because that helps them stay alive. Yep. All the little fish, in turn, maybe they eat uh, some kind of floating plankton because they just got little tiny mouths and there's no fish smaller than them. So they eat, they're vegetarians and they eat the plants. So then the humans get selfish and they change the climate such that there's a bunch of pollution in the atmosphere. The sunlight doesn't get through very well anymore, so the plankton that was eating the sunlight that was in turn eaten by the little fry, like that plankton becomes scarce. 
that's the change in resources. Because there's okay. uh, right, like the climate yeah. change changes the light, and then that plankton is more scarce, which means the little tiny fish that ate it, in turn, not very many of them reach adulthood and become good food for the fish in question, the population that we were talking about. Mm-hmm. So I wanted it to actually go the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> for my example. I can still do something with so, this. So, yeah, forget, uh, you know, whatever. The this, the weather change helps the plankton, and now there's more of the little fish. So, <laughs> okay. the, the, the population we're talking about, the species lineage that we're interested in here, has too much food now, and everybody gets to eat. And then there's so much more uh, food, and nobody, nobody dies anymore of starvation but then that also means that there's a bunch of different phenotypes of the fish i i, I even wanted to start here because i just it, it always really stuck in my head the term uh being gape limited for fish i yeah. think i got that from my cousin who's a fisheries guy in wisconsin anyway yeah the gapes are important so, you know, so you, as a fish, you can eat a certain, uh, I don't know if we, this would be called a population. You, there's a, a grouping of other objects in the sea that you can fit in your maw and some things that are too big and they don't fit. And if it doesn't fit, you're gape limited from eating those ones. But then in our population now, because there's so many more, because they have so much more food, there's a bunch of Mick Jagger fish that have giant nice. gapes. They've got an extra gape. So they're not... They can now actually move over and start eating this other type of fish that they weren't even really preying on before. Yeah. And that well, can so, be this episode yeah. where, like, that. I thought you were... You know, when you're saying that uh, a change in resources can change the diversity of the species in question and then that can sort of they can branch out into a, being another lineage because all the jaggers really like each other because they find their big gapes attractive so then they start mating with each other and they're eating these other kind of fish and maybe they even like that might be a speciation event or something i mean i suppose yeah they could like each other for the the gapes that they they all have um, there was a, I don't know where it stands at this moment. I've tried to see where other people, it wasn't a very long term study, but it was a study done in, uh, I think British Columbia in some ponds and lakes and stuff like that of these three spine stickleback fish. And they have, um, you know, this sort of. They have, you know, a lot of times, you know, variation can arise through uh, just a general, like just sort of developmental changes. And so, um, you know, and I, as I recall, it is sort of a developmental change that is kind of a key part of this example. But um, I, one of the things that they did for their experimental setup was they had these nets that they would kind of set in the water so it's like having cages but they were large enough that they then would um you know put uh the fish into these 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 nets or whatever and they didn't necessarily connect all these uh this nuclear unit that i'm talking about the you know the the change in resources to the change in population size to the change in variation and then finally some kind of diversification uh uh process but what they did was they had different densities within these different you know large net cage things and the the population sizes that were smaller and and less dense they didn't really change much in terms of the uh, initial type or the modal type if you will of trait which was a small gape tiny little gape uh and the, that's just the opening of the mouth, you know. And the thing about the opening of the mouth is that it's good for suction and you can suck up the little critters that are floating in the surface or the water column, you know. And so you can kind of go, you know, everywhere you go. Um, and then 
what happened in the cages that were really dense with fish, some of them started to change to be able to occupy the bottom of the, you know, the surface, the, the, the lake bottom or whatever. And there there's different kinds of critters and their gapes are, you know, the fish that are down towards the bottom are opening up and getting larger. And they have these things called gill rakers, um, which are on the inside of their gills, which help catch things that they may not want in their mouth, you know, that kind of thing, or they don't want to swallow or whatever. And they're starting to go after these little invertebrate crustacean type things that are hiding under the rocks and in the little, you know, leaves and stuff like that you know and so they're and they have a different mode of life even they're not as they're a little bit i guess i think they're a little bit more chunky and they kind of have a more of a um you know they just it's like an ambush like bang they just shoot at the thing to eat you know grab it and eat it whereas the guys up in the water column which would be the like the deeper water kinds of uh, uh phenotypes or whatever are kind of a little more sleek and are to, you know, better at just swimming through the, you know, the water and just sucking up the little things and stuff like that. Anyway, so yeah, there's there's a there's a res- resource enrichment episodic synchrony there. Well, it's th- doesn't that fencing in the sticklebacks have some that are both? Because then, if there's not very many sticklebacks within this fence, then they're sort of enriched or not. And if they're really well, the dense. idea would be that it would be like the result. It, it, so it doesn't do a resource enrichment, but it's like simulating in, you know, and I'm talking about it as if it's simulating. They're not trying to uh, simulate the enrichment of resources per se. But I'm saying it's like as if you simulated the increased growth of a population, say. And so if you have the higher density population, they have they develop that population develops a, a variant that then kind of starts working on the the lake bottom and then there's still the variant that's up swimming up in the kind of open water type environment um and then they kind of like it branches they start to you know and you can see how with natural selection or whatever um that the ones with the bigger gapes would end up hanging out with other ones with bigger gapes because they'd be down by the lake bottom you know and so if they were going to do any mating that's where they do mating there and versus the ones that are up in the open water they probably more likely interact with others that are in the open water with the smaller gapes and stuff i suppose tinder wouldn't work really well down there because it's so wet and really just murky and yeah i mean tinder's murky i imagine but is this this might be a bad, a really bad question. You can edit it all out. Oh no! In part, this sounds to a lay person on the outside a lot like just basic old Darwinian natural selection. What is the, like? Can you emphasize the part about this that is novel and that you're really like that? This this is my idea or whatever type thing. Well, the main thing is that, you know, when we're talking about initiation of like diversification, a lot of the times, I mean, Darwinian selection doesn't even consider like changes in resources and all these other things. Really, Darwinian selection tends to, well, there's variation and the the population has, um, you know, enough variation to be able to essentially kind of like experiment with the world and to improve on whatever the traits they do have. So any fish that's a little faster or a fish whose gapes just a little bit bigger, you know, or whatever it is that it over time, if that is useful and serves the, it's bearer well, will tend to um, produce more or it'll tend to survive better than the others and it will tend to produce more offspring. And uh, those offspring will inherit that larger gape or whatever it is. And over time, you'll then get, get kind of uh, canalized into this particular trait, configuration, or whatever it is. But that's not this, that's just sort of taking a perspective almost from, uh, you know, the, the, almost like the engineering of the trade itself. Like, Oh, okay. Well, if you've got this thing and then you can kind of, and it, it serves you better than, than this other individual who, you know, is more or less this sort of similar to you. Uh, then 
you know, you, you may do better in the end, you know, uh, or others like you on average will do better. So that's just plain old like natural selection and that over time those traits will be selected. But this is saying uh, in any in any case, it, what it kind of is saying is that in in a way selection often gets kind of put on pause while if it's a resource enrichment event where there's so much resource so many resources that it's not like um all the the little you know the you know the individuals that don't have as big a gape or that don't have this and that they're surviving so they're actually doing better than you know they would otherwise perhaps and so something like purifying selection or negative selection uh, or just plain old like not finding a mate you know because you just don't survive as well it, you know you don't get as much nutrition and therefore you don't you know your gonads don't produce the right amount of sperm or whatever it is or maybe you're just not as like you don't have as much energy and you're not like yeah give me you know that kind of thing so uh that's kind of um in this situation it's it's being kind of relaxed it's being you know put on pause or slowed down or whatever it's its effects are not as strong um and so what the only this is is just a model piecing a bunch of these things together and just saying, well, okay, imagine if it's resources that start this thing and you kind of see how you can go from A to B. Um, but selection is just like a, I mean, there are some people who think natural selection is just driving everything and that's all it is. And there's, who cares if things change in the environment necessarily until like, you know, it only affects, you know, it's like a, I'm not, I, I just said, who cares, but that's not what I mean. Um, it's kind of like the environment can change and then it's just like, well, you know, the environment changed and whoever's good enough can live, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, this isn't exactly like that. This, this is, on uh, much shorter timescales than I think that something like natural selection, which can happen much, you know, really quickly, but, um, this is a different dynamic, although there can be long time scales. I won't get into all those. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But I don't know if this helped or not, but there's no well, one, voice feedback from you. So I, and I, we have our monitors off. So I don't know. One thing that I picked up in it as in part because I happen to like it. And then I'm also thinking uh, PR style, like how am I going to market this? Um <laughs> This is the gestalt revolution in biology. Uh, pre previous to the Ryan revolution, we only oh. cared about the lineages themselves, you know, the individuals, the organisms. But as Korzybski taught us, one ought not think of the organism as separate from rather than a integral part of its environment. There's only organism in environment as a whole. And we need to make this holistic shift to looking at the system of which the lineages are a component whose behaviors we happen to find interesting and therefore obsess over. But <laughs> it's actually, you know, just this big soup. You know, when you're in the spaceship above looking down, there's just all this stuff happening. And you got to look at the environment as well as the organisms. Yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's definitely, and I kind of pull that from, uh, you know, that Richard Lewinton, who recently passed away, he was a population geneticist, and he came up with that idea of the niche construction. Anyway, um, yeah, he has a whole thing about organism and environment and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, so, uh. The impoverishment scenario, though, that you were kind of coming up with, that also can have an impact. Like one of the the ways I was thinking about it is, you know, if resources are decreasing and population sizes are, are crashing and getting smaller, maybe even fragmented, the, um, the populations can become, uh, you know, susceptible to just accidents and a lot of randomness that happens in the world. And so you could be really well suited, but there's just not that 
many of you, and maybe you don't find a mate as as easily because there's far fewer, or um, you know, maybe some, a tree falls on your head, whatever. You know, suddenly you could have major changes in the traits themselves, and this is what is called uh, genetic drift. And so you can have these, you know, big changes where um, it's this fixation or loss of traits that happen. I've, I've mentioned that maybe a, a couple times, maybe even in our in the letters I've sent. So that can also happen as populations are going down and, and potentially, you know, there can be a shift towards some other way of living or find some other way resource to utilize. Um, anyway. There's there's that approach to it, and then there's also the application of this to possibly other systems outside of natural selection of species lineages. It might also work for various social or economic situations, right? I mean, we don't have to get yeah. into it in depth, but yeah. at an abstract level, this episodically synchronous model might work for other types of complex systems. Yeah, I think just because wherever you have some kind of input output, you know, system or, you know, um, you know, kind of a resource driver type system, I think you could probably get it so long as it's got many little parts uh, that interact and work together and that there's variation, uh, you know, I think those, you know, these things can work. Yeah. And you could probably come up with, if it's even different, that try partite or whatever thing about evolution will happen anytime there's heredity scarcity and whatever the what are those three you know wherever there's uh you know a surplus variation and inheritance and that kind of thing yeah the episodic synchrony could have a list like that or maybe it's already that same list it's pretty much that same list because it's basically a matter of just asking questions of those three things is saying like, well, what if more do survive? You know, that kind of thing. It's like, um, you know, and then what would that do to variation? And then what, you know, so in a lot of ways, it's just a springboard. And here I am being a game player and these are these game rules and I'm playing with it, you know. So that's the idea. You want to say anything else about it? I do not. You do not. <laughs> oh, my God. That's a first. Oh, Oh, yeah. For for the purposes of time, uh, I you know, because, you know, it's something we could go on and on. I could go on and on about. And you could keep prodding me and I could keep going and then be like, holy shit, it's three o'clock. So that's happened before. <laughs> that's true. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so we've done game playing. Uh, a, a game playing scenario. How about a overseeing scenario <laughs> i think this mostly constitutes overseeing i do some game playing things too of course um and part of the time but i think that mostly the epistemology as a whole seems to be largely an oversight camp activity would you think so yeah i think so I do. I think uh, um, just because it's kind of it, it, it just it's looking at whatever the it feels like it's looking at the the rule set thing, you know, the the claim in a language made by an agent, you know, that kind of stuff. You're looking, you know, at the behavior of the individuals you know um but anyway i don't want to talk yeah. too much well, right, right. Uh, the traditional definition of epistemology or at least you know the one i was taught in school is that that's the study of knowledge what do we know and how do we know it knowledge and then justification what uh you know prove it right make what's your argument so all that stuff fits under that umbrella. And I can't remember. It was somebody that I don't agree with most of the time. Either Descartes, Kant, Plato, all of them. Somebody said epistemology is first philosophy. And I think I do tend to agree with that. 
I want to say you need to look at who is, you know, because any claim made in philosophy, science, conversation, whatever, it's going to be made by an agent and in a language. And I, that's my obsession, I guess. Let's talk about that. What, what, how does this, what is this agent and how does it work? And what, is their, what language are they expressing this claim in? And then justify this claim and all of that stuff. And so, and I think that at least on this overseeing level, since that universally applies to, you know, any game you're playing or anything you want to engineer or any truth you seek, it's always going to, well, that's right in there. It's you. Okay, well, what are you? And how do you go about this? And why should I listen to what you're saying afterwards? These questions, to me, apply to everything, and therefore that's what it means by first. Like, they're primary because they're uh, ubiquitous. And it's then when I go into examining that, one of the first things that you run into in philosophy, epistemology, 101, whatever, is all of these traditional skeptical arguments. The, the most famous probably being Descartes' dream hypothesis, uh, made famous by the Matrix. <laughs> uh, I, that, well, what if, yes, it seems to you as though you are seated by the fire writing a treatise about epistemology, but perhaps you are merely dreaming that you are doing that. And right. that any of these sort of, uh, that my colleague, my friend, my co-host Ryan calls arguments from absurdity, right? This is <laughs> what those are, right? If I understand the way right. you use that. that. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah go what No, I think so. I, I, anytime, like, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I used some kind of, you know, we were talking about uh, my idea in the past, and then you just sort of, you started talking about fish and the gapes of mouths and stuff. That's not really, I'm not saying it was an argument per se, but imagine that being an argument. It doesn't seem like it's coming from, you know, it, you're using all these things that, that you know, like gapes, and, and, and you're talking about fish, and you know what I mean? Like it's a... It's not left field, I guess, is, you know, and so an argument from absurdity, which is generally also fine, I think, um, is, you know, to me coming from, you know, uh, you know, it's the whole like, well, say, you, oh, you know, an argument from absurdity is the uh, UFOs landing on the White House lawn or something like that. It just has this like, OK, wh what's going on? You know, like it's asking uh, it requires a suspension of belief or something like that. Um, or disbelief, suspend your disbelief type of thing um, in order to get the point across or whatever. I don't, I don't know about that way of saying it because, of course, my the moral of my story is going to be suspend all your beliefs. So I want well, yes. people to or, have only no, disbelief. It's suspend, suspend your disbelief, you know. It requires people to, if it's an argument from absurdity, it requires people to, to kind of lift their skeptical caps just a little bit, you know, because otherwise they'll just shut them down tight over their ears and be like, nope, I'm not talking about aliens, you know, that kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like you could see as a person, like a philosopher trying to come up with one of the many examples that they have where you're like, all right, this is a little out, out there, but, you know, I'll just go with it. You know, like imagine there's a, another world that's just like this world, yeah. but it's, you know, like. <laughs> That's where somebody could easily become quite dogmatic and just shut down and just be like, nope, I want to end the way, I just want to end your speech, you know, like the, completely, like shut up, you know. That's kind of what I'm trying to say. They, you have to ask them to suspend their disbelief is what I meant to say. Hmm. Okay. I think I know what you're saying. I wouldn't say it that way because I categorize belief as an epistemic term but what I hear you describing is an aesthetic resistance. It is not to your taste. And so, therefore, I will ask you to stop talking or I will close my ears or whatever. But it's not because you necessarily 
disbelieve what I'm saying. It's just that you find it distasteful, is how I look at those, or that reaction. I guess the suspend your disbelief, I think, is just a saying in the English language. It's something like, you know... Uh, all swans are white or what, you know, like it's that, it's, oh, yeah, it's like yeah. a thing, you know what I mean? So it's a, the, the specific word of disbelief per se is, is not what I'm. Yeah. Just play the game, know. Harlan. God damn it. <laughs> don't, <laughs> so don't like, tell yeah. me I'm using the wrong word. You know what I mean? All right. I, I think I do. Okay. There are skeptical arguments that you encounter early on in your philosophical journey. And yes. then. Kind of like how I became an atheist when I went to confirmation at church type, you know, you get, (laughs) it's supposed to be confirming your faith, but you know, you're this teenage punk, rebellious, whatever, and you go to this thing and you hang out with five other people and the pastor and they're like, yeah, this day, this and so, and here's the thing you got to write down and you got to believe this crap. And you're like, well, that seems weird. I'm not willing to suspend my disbelief about that. <laughs> that story sounds like bullshit to me. And you ask questions, and they fail to answer those questions. And you're like, oh, well, I guess this is not the belief system for me. Right. You go to college, and you go to epistemology class, and they present these skeptical arguments to you. And then you say, I'm take recording. three. Oh, my God. I didn't turn my Bitcoin miner off while we were trying to record, and it crashed my computer. (laughs) Technical Bitcoin difficulties. So now it's yet another day, and I'm all wired up from cashing in a poker tournament, but we're going to try to finish this review. It's been days. All right. I was talking about enemy skepticism. Make an analogy to how you go to confirmation and you ask the pastor questions and they can't answer your questions to your satisfaction. And you're like, well, I guess this doesn't work. And that, so then I was going to say, you go to Epistemology 101 and you encounter early on these classical skeptical arguments. I think we already mentioned the Cartesian dream hypothesis and the... and Descartes' demon and all this stuff. Like, you could be fooled by someone into any of the beliefs you have. And others. All the way back to ancient Greece and probably others. But we're Western chauvinists, so we usually stop at the Greeks. Yes. And then you say, oh, okay. Well, I'm a stupid college kid. I don't know what's going on. That seems like a pretty convincing argument to me. What did the other side say? What do the dogmatists say? And to my experience, it was very similar to how you would ask the pastor, oh, okay, so what happens when God designs a rock that he can't lift or whatever, the omnipotence paradoxes? Well, what are are we going to do with these skeptical arguments? And... The response, shockingly to some freshmen, was to instantly and blatantly beg the question. And just many even reputable and canonical epistemologists will respond to skeptical arguments thusly. Those are kind of interesting curiosities. We know that they cannot be correct because we know that we know things. Therefore, any argument which concludes that we don't know things is inherently wrong, and it's just an interesting exercise to figure out how they appear to be correct and uh, indefatigable or whatever. We can't point out flaws in them. Not indefatigable. What's the word? (laughs) <laughs> Not incorrigible. Indefatigable. What? Come on, man. Indefeasible. Indefatigable. <laughs> Indefeasible, I think, is the word I want. We need Joe Biden on Come this on, one. Man. Like, you know, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, man, take your vaccine or you, we, we're going to make a mandate. The, the headlines are like, eh, Biden puts out a mandate. And no, he doesn't. Come on, man. There's this very restricted thing about encouraging businesses. Okay, 
What are you? You're distracting me. <laughs> Sorry. We can't find flaws in these arguments, but we know that they're wrong because we already know that we know things. Therefore, they must be wrong. And the exercise of epistemology is to figure out why skeptical arguments appear persuasive nonetheless. And I go, what? That's as ridiculous as my pastor talking about the rock that God can't lift. You can't do that. Come on, man. You can't just say, oh, no, no, we already know that we know things. So if you have an argument that looks like we can't, then we, we know you to be wrong. Yeah, it's... That's a... I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, that's a dumb one, you know? I mean, but... You know, I, I just wanted uh, to give you I, space there to step in if you had anything to say. No, I, I don't have it. I mean, we already know that we know things. Jesus Christ. I mean, that already has a circularity to it, but whatever. Yeah, all right. I mean, I know you were saying it's begging the question mm-hmm. and all that. I'm just saying, like... We already know that we know things. Anyway, continue. So then one of the places the conversation can go after that is that they will try to make a paradox of skepticism where they will try to accuse the skeptic of saying, aha, what are you trying to do? Claim that you know that we don't know things? Well, you can't do that because you're a skeptic, so you can't make knowledge claims. And... Okay. Right. That's fair. And that's part of the motivation for me stressing the normative aspect in this version of skepticism that I am putting forth. Whether other people have discovered it before me, I am unaware it's possible because this isn't super groundbreaking, but it seems new to me. I haven't heard other people say it, but it also seems quite persuasive. So, all right, the skeptic isn't allowed to say, you know you don't know things. Agreed. I'm going to try to design an argument in favor of a skeptical conclusion that's robust and interesting and hopefully novel, but doesn't succumb to any obvious paradoxical counterpoints and it's quite simple here to recapitulate is a version of like a simplification of a normative meta epistemological skeptical argument premise one (laughs) if one is alternatively you could use my version and say one ought to be But either way, you can make it a conditional, you can make it a normative statement. If one is sensitive to arguments, or, you know, I don't even know how far to oversimplify. If you're reasonable, and then reasonableness would be defined as sensitive to argument, sensitive to argument would be defined as your behavioral tendencies are positively correlated with the conclusions of arguments that you cannot point out flaws in. Do, <laughs> does any of that make sense? I think sensitive to, sensitive to argument is perfectly fine. Sensitivity, I, I think that's, uh, that's fine because to me, I think of, um, you know, someone is not impervious to an argument or whatever. So, you know, it's sensitivity means you re- receive the information. You have some degree of patience and you're going to listen, you know. Th- that's what it comes to for me. I don't know about it. I need to go slightly further than you receive the information because I want it to have some sort of behavioral efficacy. I want it to change your behavior. I think there are people, I guess maybe this is where I was coming from with that one. I think there are people who really kind of don't receive the information. You know, it's like they really have extraordinarily, you know, selective hearing or whatever it is. You know, we may even skip over phrases or words. You know, it's like the whole confirmation bias thing. You could be reading something and only picking out the things that serve you and your thought or belief or whatever it is. 
and totally skipping over the other stuff that the person might have been writing about, which could actually kind of balance out the whole thing, you know. Um, so I sometimes wonder if we do just really hard select things. And, you know, the dogmatist would definitely fall into this type of category, I think, more often than, than not. So somebody who's sensitive is there's a persuadability or something mm -hmm. to them. Like anyway. Openness or... Uh, yeah, whatever. Those psychological things. Conscientious. Open. No. Ah. <laughs> so that's as simple as premise one is. I'm just saying, well, if you're even reasonable, if you're sensitive to arguments, and premise two, there are sound arguments, parentheses, slash, whatever, indefeasible arguments, ones with which you cannot explicitly point out a flaw, which indicate that knowledge is inaccessible. And then, you know, there's sub-arguments to indicate that they are, whatever. If you're sensitive to arguments, and there are arguments that say knowledge is inaccessible to you, then, conclusion, you ought not make knowledge claims. So that's as short and simple as that is. Then the sub-arguments for the two premises themselves, I think they've both got separate episodes. One, there needs to be an argument argument to say, all right, well, should you be sensitive to arguments? Should you be a reasonable agent? And I think so. Yep. And, you know, but then there needs argumentation for that. And then two, there are sound arguments which indicate that knowledge is inaccessible. That's just the stable of skeptical argumentation that has been developed by epistemologists over the years. Uh, once you have those two things, which I think that most, at least, you know, contemporary philosophers would accept, it seems to me to be just a very short step to this NME skeptical conclusion that, okay, well, let's not make knowledge claims anymore. Let's totally get rid of dogmatism. We all want to be reasonable, right? Yeah. And we've got these skeptical arguments that you can't find flaws in, right? Well, yes, we already went through some of those. Okay, well, stop making knowledge claims. Is that what you really think? <laughs> like, I mean, like, would you, in, I mean, like, for instance, I immediately start thinking about what motivations people might possess uh, to not take that second step. You know, while they would say, okay, those two premises sort of in a reductionist way, let's say, you know, they go, oh, yeah, I accept that one. Oh, yeah, I accept that one, you know. But when you put them together in a particular way, the way that you're doing, and then you say, then we ought not make knowledge claims. Um, I can almost see somebody say, yeah, yeah, okay. But then not want to follow through with that because it almost seems, and I, I'm not obviously a language guy, but does this, I guess would be my question, does this then maybe fall into the idea of... Uh, Knowledge claims may not work when we talk about being sensitive to argumentation and, um, you know, the an accepting of skeptical uh, 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 points about knowledge. Um, but the thing is that it really works great for rhetoric or something. You know what I mean? Like it, it in that realm. It's like, yeah, yeah. And then, but then in another realm of linguistic endeavor, it's like people want those knowledge claims so they can bang each other over the head. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, but I hate Jerry and he's going to fucking get the truth. I'm going to cram the facts in his face. You know, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like there almost seems to need, there almost seems, it's like there needs to be an additional acknowledgement of the chimp or something, you know, like the chimp that talks, you know, and it's like, and so how, how do you deal with that? Because it almost seems like, 
you know, there's a bit of the my precious maybe going on with the knowledge claims. Uh, you know, like, do you do you follow yeah, at all I think what so. I'm, I'm saying? I mean, no, you could always be mistaken. Well, the first place that my brain went when you started talking about that was to some of the Achilles and the Tortoise dialogues in Gerda Lesterbach by Douglas Hofstadter, where he was asking us to consider the situation where one side, one interlocutor presents a very ironclad logical in italics in the what i think is the literal sense a logical argument and then the other side says okay i accept your premises but i refuse to accept the conclusion and that i think that comes to a tacit denial of the rules of whatever logic is being employed by interlocutor a by achilles when he's making this argument, okay, well, you understand what one is, right? And you understand what plus is and equals. So one plus one is two, right? And then the the tortoise can always say, well, you know, sure, I, and I claim to understand one and plus and equals, but I refuse to say that one plus one is two. You, yeah. in an existential sense, are always or often capable of being intransigent and incorrigible and denying these conclusions. Um, but to me, that just comes down to, well, okay, you've all, you've broken premise one, because premise one is if you're being reasonable right now. And someone who does that is, by definition, not being reasonable, at least at the moment. I think there are plenty of times when being unreasonable is totally fine. For example, when you're telling a joke, telling a story, you know, hey, whatever. Uh, even teaching people things, etc. You don't always need to be reasonable. But if you are, during the time that you are, then I'm claiming you ought to not make knowledge claims. Okay, listeners, do you get it now? <laughs> there was another thing I was going to say about that, but now I forgot it. Does that address anything you were saying? Yeah. I mean, yes, I have more to say, but I I want to I want to explore it like offline, if ah, you know what mm-hmm. I mean, sometime. <laughs> Rather than, you know, force, you know. It, it it almost yeah, I have no idea if it's another topic or not. But. Another place it's been addressed on the podcast in the past, I think, is when we talked about Anatole Rappaport's conflict in man-made environment. Because uh, mm-hmm. part of what you were saying is there's this chimpy response where, yeah, even so, whatever, there's these arguments, but I don't care because what I currently prioritize is injuring Chuck and... Your philosophical arguments about skepticism are irrelevant to me. If I need to make knowledge claims to motivate my armies to go to war, I'm going to fucking do it. And that's fine, but that's part of what I want to be the cold-blooded version of acknowledging the benefits of enemy skepticism. Because, it seems to me, enemy skeptics are highly unlikely to be militant. Because we're we we don't choose to be dogmatic about things and therefore it would indeed be difficult to motivate chimpy violence and i see that as a benefit well for sure yeah i i this is its own little thing that i think it would be good for us to talk about but i, I this is a review damn it <laughs> yeah <laughs> So I just want the idea out there, you know, again, again, God damn it. Um, and now it is. And now it is. It's just, it's out there to our 27.7 listeners. That's right. So all 27 of you. Of course, none of them have listened to this mo- minute in the podcast anyways. Well, I guess maybe we can get at least, if, if half of them have, we can start our own little pyramid scheme where they tell the same number, 27 or whatever number it is, to listen to this thing. And then they tell 27 and it just, you know, 
Is that even a? That's not a pyramid scheme. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> it would form a pyramid. We exponential growth. We would be at the top. <laughs> Whatever it is, we should be at the top. Oh, yeah. Um. Okay. Well. So yeah. Anyway, that's the that's the basics of enemy skepticism and the the motivation behind, or at least the first step. Because the sub arguments are as interesting as that one, I think, about you know, should we even be sensitive to arguments and what are the skeptical arguments, blah blah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, go back and listen to those episodes. <laughs> <laughs> we ain't got time to cover them now. Ain't got We've time to bleed. Enough. All right. Thanks, Jesse. <laughs> so you're fucking governor. All right. Remember when Jesse Ventura was the governor? <laughs> I do. Those were the days. They were. They were. All right. Well, then I guess this was a long one. It was a review. I'm sorry to the audience who thought or hoped, all 27.7 of you, that it was going to be new information. But, ha <laughs> ha, bazinga. It is not. Okay, my yeah, son is now to you. coming to. Hey, you should be taking a shower. Oh, shit, he did. You got five minutes. What? You just used a should. You don't like those. Oh. A little parenting. I mean, remember, I was talking about rhetoric and, you know, anyway. Because I said so. That should be the name of this one. <laughs> you should be a skeptic because I fucking said so. <laughs> All right. Well, we've dawdled long enough on this fucking thing. Don't you think? Yep. All right. Over and out. Editing nightmare commence. <laughs>